Hello, Salon Sleuth fans. My name is Melissa and my co-host is Leslie. We decided we wanted to share our salon stories. We both have an interest in crime stories and a fascination with the psychic world. So settle in each week as we share another story with you. Who knows, you might even learn something. Thank you for joining us today. We will be talking about the Piddick Mansion and the Shanghai Tunnels. We do have special guests that we are working with today. They are the Fireside Phantoms podcast. They are hosted by Holly Peterson and Carol Conchero. Hope you enjoy the show. My name's Holly Peterson and I'm Carol Conchero. And we are Fireside Phantoms and our show is basically about anything that's paranormal or off the cuff or strange or spooky, weird, like campfire stories. That's kind of what we like kind of go for. So the Piddock Mansion, um, us local Port- Portlanders know the Piddock Mansion is a very famous mansion here in Portland. Um, it got constructed from 1909 to 1914. Um, it has 16,000 square feet and 46 rooms, and it sits on 46 acres of property in the West Hills of Portland. The views from the mansion on a clear day, you can see Mount Hood, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, Mount Rainier, and Mount Jefferson. So Henry Pittock came over um, on the Oregon Trail from Pittsburgh in 1863. He was just a teenager at the time, but he wanted to experience the adventures of the West. So he came over on the Oregon Trail. He got a job at the local paper, the Oregonian. And then, this is a really cool part of the story, um, the owner of the Oregonian, he had ventured into politics. And so President Lincoln decided to commission him as the U.S. Com- or I'm, I'm going to say that again. Uh, President Lincoln decided to name him the U.S. Commissioner to the Kingdom of Hawaii. So, so he was like, "Bye, going to Hawaii." Nice. <laughs> and then he like looked around and threw the keys over to Henry Pittock and said, "The paper's yours. I'm out of here." So Henry Pittock took over the Oregonian and started writing the newspaper. Um, he did. He actually, after he took over ownership of the newspaper, he married his sweetheart. Um, he was 25, and he married his 15-year-old girlfriend, Georgiana, which is, you know, um, there and ready. And she's like, you're the owner of the Oregonian now. Let's get together. And he's like, sure. <laughs> Maybe that's not what happened. I don't know. But that's what happened. Like that peach. <laughs> exactly. So um, he was feeling pretty big for his britches. He decided to summit Mount Hood a couple of times, and he started a bicycle club, which is probably one of Portland's first. And he actually started the first paper mill in the area as well. His wife, Georgiana, became a philanthropist, and she helped start the Portland Rose Society, which in turn began the Portland Rose Festival that we celebrate every June in Portland. So after Georgina and Henry passed away, the Pittock Mansion stayed in the family until about 1958 um, when two of the descending grandsons decided they wanted to sell the home because they could not keep up with the maintenance costs. However, they had no luck. Nobody had the money to buy it. So they kept it. And then in 1962, the home took on a great deal of damage from the famous Columbus Day storm. Uh, The grandsons were thinking they were just going to tear it down when the city stepped in and stopped it. The people of Portland managed to raise $75,000 in three months to save the mansion. Soon after that, the city of Portland bought the home from the grandsons for $225,000, which is not much. But I guess in 1962, that was some real change. There's also been a number of films done at the Piddock Mansion. There's a movie called The First Love um, in 1970. It's a romance starring Susan Day from the Partridge family and William Catt. There's another movie called Unhinged, which was a slasher film that was banned in several countries. The Haunting of Sarah Hardy, uh, which starred Mer- Morgan Fairchild and Celia Ward, came out in 1989. And of course, Body of Evidence starring William Defoe and Madonna, came out in 1993. I remember that because I was a senior in high school when they were shooting it, and I was looking all over Portland for Madonna. And then, um, actually, also, The Amazing Race finished its 13th season at the Piddock Mansion. It was the finish line. I thought that was all kind of interesting trivia about the house. So, Carol, tell us why it's haunted. Thanks, Holly. I, um, you know, I really like the Piddock Mansion. Uh, It's a popular place to go tour, And so 
in touring it, they tell you all about, you know, the background of Georgiana and Henry. And the sad thing is, is that after they built this house, they were pretty uh, getting up there in the age. And so they only actually lived in the house for a total of five years. And so the theory goes that the Piddocks weren't ready to leave their beautiful home and they still haunt the place. It's actually one of the most, um, what, what do you call it, uh, active house around Portland. Uh, there's so many different reports of people seeing paranormal activity, hearing paranormal activity. Um, but the main thing is the smells. So Georgiana, because her favorite flower was the rose, tourists say they can smell roses in certain areas of the house. People have seen full body apparitions of the groundskeeper and also the couple wandering around. And I've toured this place a couple times. I didn't feel anything strange until I went into the caretaker's home on the property. And it just had a really different feeling to me than the main home. But I wouldn't say it was scary. It just felt more sad. Probably because um, they're making him in the afterlife still take care of the property. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, the caretaker's home is bigger than most people's homes today. So I don't think he had it too badly working for them. <laughs> it is also said that... Um, Reports of portraits and paintings, they'll move on their own. People have seen riding boots walking around the grounds without legs. And that could be the caretaker or Henry, because Henry was a big mountain uh, climber. He loved the outdoors. So it could be either of those two. And windows opening and shutting on their own, especially on the sleeping porches. And I've always kind of wondered what sleeping porches were. I didn't know if it was like you get locked out if you, you know, come home too late and you have to sleep on the sleeping porch. But I guess it's where you would be um, resting if you were sick. They thought fresh air did you a lot of good. And so they had these open sleeping porches, which I thought was kind of cool. So there's a lot of activity with that where they um, have the windows op opened and getting fresh air in that area. Um, uh, and like most people say, the presence that they're feeling there isn't ominous, uh, but it is obvious to many who regularly spend the time at the place. There's a female employee that said just as she closed up the mansion, turning off all the lights to go home, all of a sudden the lights turned back on, all of them at once. <laughs> I don't think I would go back after that, friendly or not. That's just creepy. And that's most of the stories I read about the mansion. Did you have anything to add on that? I do. Um, I think that last story about the employee who was leaving and turned off all the lights and all the lights turned back on, usually with a haunted house, it's the opposite. It's like you turn off all the lights and all of a sudden they all go off. Right. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting yeah. that it's in the reverse. <laughs> So that's the Piddock Mansion. Awesome. Did you, So you did go actually through it and do the whole tour? I've been through it, and so has Carol. Yeah, I've done it twice. Yeah, we've been you through it. You know, that's it. really funny. Um, I've never been through it, but my mom years ago was a tour guide. <laughs> oh, at the Piddock <laughs> Mansion? Yeah, but I think I must have probably been in middle school at that time, and I was never close to my mom. So I was like, whatever, you do your thing, I'll do mine. Most so, likely. Now, if she was here, I'd be asking her all kinds of things about it, you know. Right. Things are different now, but <laughs> I'm going to have to go up there and do that once everything's settled down a little. Good Christmas. Christmas is really beautiful. It's I bet so it is. I hope it's all done by then, all this mess. It's just gorgeous. When you're up there, you can see all of downtown Portland. You really have a panoramic view. And of course, you know, because they were really into gardening, it's just gorgeous with all the flowers. The city has really done a great job with replanting everything, making it really lush and green. I mean, I almost enjoyed the outdoors more than the indoors, personally. Isn't there a hike that goes from, like, basically the waterfront all the way up? 
It there has a is. name to it. What is it called? Do you know? Um, I am not sure what the name of the trail is, but there is definitely a couple of trails back in there that you can take. And I will yeah. say the house also has some really interesting things to see in it. Um, you know, for its time, it had a lot of luxuries. It had even an elevator that worked. And what I was struck by is in the bathroom, they had what looked like a torture device with these metal prongs coming out of the shower that looked like it was going to burn you. But it was basically like a stand-up whirlpool. Like it it shot out these massaging sprays of powerful water. And I thought, wow, that's pretty kinky or cool, depending on how you look at it. I think the ghosts spend a lot of time in that room, personally. <laughs> They're so dirty. They are <laughs> dirty ghosts. That's awesome. Well, downtown Portland can be dirty. <laughs> well, yes, it can. Speaking yeah. of which, do you have a story for us about downtown Portland? I do. It's actually a, a closer to the water. Um, we are going to be talking, or I'm going to be talking about the Shanghai Tunnels. Nice. Hey. Um, and it's super interesting. There's so many different things that I could talk about this. There's the the history of it. And then there's the guy who found it and um, not not found it, but founded the Shanghai Tunnel Tours. And then there's the whole haunted portion of it. So we can talk about, let's go into um, the Shanghai Tunnels. Um, I don't know if that was what it was actually originally called. They used to be these underground tunnels all over downtown Portland because it, we'd have these big ships that would come in from the ocean and instead of using the streets to um, transport all the goods to all the different stores they would use the underground tunnels and so they would basically take them to the basements of all these stores underground and then they would be able to pick up their shipments that way and then put them into the stores and that that's what the um the tunnels were originally used for i didn't know that that's interesting yeah um because i mean i don't think you would know it now but this is so stupid. I live in Portland. I was born here. It never occurred to me like port land, like <laughs> it's an actual port. Like don't feel bad. That's something <laughs> we would do. Yeah. And you know what? It wasn't until I did one of those, um, you know, those water tours with the big jet boats down on the water. Yes. They're the ones that told the whole history of like the whole river and all of this stuff. And I was like, port land. Okay. It, it all sunk in at that moment. <laughs> Just like, this is also really stupid. And Popeye in olive oil. I didn't really think of her name as like olive oil, like it's <laughs> the olive oil. I just thought that was her name was olive oil. Um, You're just so it was one of those aha thinker. moments. That's all. I, uh, just very literal. And this is why I can't see ghosts because it, it all has to make sense. And I really wish I could. But anyway, so that's Will. the whole Portland was really a boom in place. It's where a lot of stuff came in. It was much easier to bring it in on ships off the from the river or you know using the river because it's 122 miles to the ocean versus going up and over the mountain range using whatever cars or you know um, wagons or whatever at that time to bring over the goods so instead you would just bring them on on these big ships um so that's why they were there then there was a little boy um his name was michael jones in he around 1951 is when he was born so when he was seven years old this is now around 1958 his dad was some sort of um, janitor. He used to clean places. And sometimes he would bring his little son, Michael Jones, with him. And this was downtown Portland. And so he was hired to maybe clean out, um, I don't know if they were stores or whatever, but he was sort of a, a janitor. And um, his little son would come along with him. And his son was super outgoing. He would just strike up a conversation with whoever. So he met um, all kinds of friends. He befriended a he called him an old timer. Now I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if he was a homeless man or whatever, but they would start talking and he started telling him about the history of Portland and how there's these underground tunnels. And this little boy really did not believe him. And so one day he's like, I'll show you. So he takes this little boy. The, he doesn't even tell his dad. He just goes off with this homeless man or an old timer. And he shows them the entrance to one of these tunnels and he's, he gives them a match and basically he lights it which you don't give a seven-year-old a match. And so he was like in disbelief anyway that he got it lit and then he could see the entrance of this tunnel and he'd been fascinated ever since. So that's how um, Michael actually figured out these tunnels. Then his dad's like, hey, listen, I will take you over there, but you can't take run off from me. You have to like, you know, be with me. So I think the dad really helped him, you know, and then they would um, 
kind of go through and I think they were um, like kind of excavating and cleaning out some of these tunnels. And that's the man who originated, you know, founded the Shanghai tunnels and then all the tours. So the tours didn't actually happen until the 1990s, but you know, he had been doing, um, uh, you know, been down in those tunnels. He knew it very well for all those years in between the two. He was also a professor at PSU. He taught some history classes um, and he had, he had married a woman. They never had children, but he really um, was all about the history of the tunnels and really wanted to preserve what that was down there. And so a lot of times they would just go down there digging around, trying to find old, um, the history, um, things that were to prove what had actually happened while they were down there. So the story was um, basically, and I don't even know what year this could have been, where they would actually Shanghai these people. In Chinatown, basically, there's this the restaurant um, bar is it's so there there's a part in that restaurant or that bar area where the floor would just drop out, and so supposedly this is how they would collect these people. Um, they would get them really drunk, and they would set them up in certain par- parts of this bar, and the floor would drop drop out, and nobody would know that that person was then missing because the floor would just come right back up. These people were brought down to the tunnels. Basically, they were drugged. They were they were they took their shoes so they couldn't run, and oh. then they would wake up on these ships. I and so basically, it shoes. was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they t- there's a whole pile of shoes if you've gone down there. Have you guys done the tours? I don't remember shoes though. I don't either. Maybe oh they yeah, there's of- a whole yeah. They would take their shoes so they couldn't run, and so they would basically wake up on these ships after their you know, drug induced stupor. And, um, they were basically free labor. Now, if they could live out this whole thing, maybe this ship would bring them back, but chances are most of the people that left never came back. And, you know, so there is piles of shoes. There's these different dens that are down there. They almost look like little bunk beds, but Mm -hmm. it's kind of like where they were hidden down there. And I don't think they really made much noise because they gave them like, they called them the opioid dens where these people would just be all drugged out and then would just wake up on these ships and be free labor. And so it's so low under the ground that even if they tried to yell or scream, nobody's going to hear them. They're underground. They're way underground. Well, they're, you know, right below all the buildings, Mm -hmm. but it is just rock and dirt. They're dirt floors. But think about it. What's above them is a bar. So most of the time it is just loud and noisy anyway. And everyone's drunk. Everyone's doing their thing. How come no one's made a horror movie about that? Could you imagine being trapped under a bar like that? No one can hear you scream. Well, I guess they filmed um, part of Grimm down there. That doesn't surprise me. And they've also, the ghost hunters have been down there, or ghost adventures. So I was really excited. I went on Instagram, and I was just looking up different things. And I found two tour guides that were down there and who had been there for like 10 years working for Michael Jones. And so I had an interview with them earlier today about it. And I wanted to get some of their creepy stories, like firsthand things that they had experienced. A lot of times they worked in pairs. So there would be one person in front of the tour and the person in the back so that nobody would be mm-hmm. behind there and not get hurt because there's certain areas that would maybe there'd be a dip or the beams were below or you could hit yourself on a pipe. So there were two people down there, you know, working the crowd. And um, so one of them was this Michael... Jones was being, doing the tour guide and um, he was the founder who has now passed. He's um, passed away in March 29th of this year. Oh. And so he was doing a tour. The girl that I met through Instagram, her name is Annalise. Her stepdad was visiting from, I believe from Idaho. He's a professional photographer. And so Michael's doing the tour and all of a sudden he starts like coughing and kind of choking. So her stepdad takes a picture, a few pictures of him. And, um, you know, it's like, the, it's not like with your phone, it's like a real camera. So it wasn't until he was able to get back home where, you know, he downloads the pictures and he can see an arm around the guy's neck <gasps> and you can see like the side of his ear, no. like you could see his side of his face she's going to send me that picture if I get it I'll forward it to you guys as well but um yeah so he you know he doesn't remember a whole lot of it he just knew he had been choking and so of course they're all freaking out then um more recently and you know I think she hasn't done this now for two years but um she um was also very active and involved with Michael Jones she really helps that family out it sounds like still to this day she would do anything to help her especially since she's on her own now with Michael gone. And um, 
she said, I think it was Ghost Adventures did an episode um, in the Shanghai Tunnels, and they asked her to play a part of one of the characters they believe was down there, who happened to be a Native American woman named Nina. And I, she, she was telling the story as if I should know who this Nina is, and I don't remember the story had they told it to me during the tour. But the way she was saying it, I felt like I should know, and I didn't want to ask her. But um, so Nina, I suppose, was a um, like a Native American, and somehow she had a role in the Shanghai Tunnels. So in they must have known this story through the the Ghost Adventures because they asked this Annalise to play the part of Nina. And so they're kind of doing like this reenactment um, on the show. And she said that night um, she lived in downtown Portland, which isn't too close, too far from where the Shanghai Tunnel is. She goes, that night I felt really weird. And so she gets home. She immediately turns on her light and the light bulb explodes. She believes when she did the reenactment of this woman um, and for this TV show that something had clung on to her during that part of the show because when she was riding her bike home she felt like there was something with her so when she gets home and she turns on her light the light bulb just explodes and she's like oh god what did I what did I get myself into to where like she really thought and um, this Nina was like a beautiful um you know Native American princess like you would think of Pocahontas you know with the beautiful hair and all of this um when she started being able to see this woman she would um like oh she told me the story she was in her bathroom and she felt like something on her back she looked in the mirror and there's these big scratches on her back I, and she so she's looking um at the reflection in the mirror of these scratches on her back and she looks in the mirror and she could see her she could see and nina. she wasn't beautiful you could see nina what's that you could see nina yeah this nina she could see nina or who she believes to be nina, nina was, in the reflection in the mirror I'm sorry. You said Nina was not beautiful. So she thought she was. All these stories of Nina, she thought she was this beautiful Indian princess. What she saw in the reflection, she was not pretty. She had broken teeth, her hair and her dress was like all ripped up. And so she was not this. So which makes you even think like um, in one of our episodes, we did a past life regression. So all my life, I believed that I lived in this one era, this one time and I could visually like I felt it. I knew it. But when I did the past life regression, it wasn't anything I expected it to be. Right. So then you have to think that must be the truth because it wasn't what I imagined. So I'm imagining she thought you know, Nina was this beautiful person. And then when you actually see her, then you know your mind's not making it up. Oh, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So she sees this reflection and she, you know, of course, freaks out. It gets so bad to the point where she was sleeping. Her boyfriend was there and he woke up and saw this woman next to the refrigerator. Like he could see her. Other people are seeing her. Wow. And at the time she was going through, um, I think she said dental hygiene school. And um, other students could see her with her. Oh, gee. She, she actually has to go. So she did her own traditional trying to get rid of this thing on her mm -hmm. own. She ended up having to go to a medium here locally where she was able to do, to be able to get her at that attachment off of her. Do you think? And she said she picked her. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go do ahead. you think no, that sorry. Nina reached out to her because, or clinged on to her because she knew she was in dental school? And she needed her teeth fixed. <laughs> well, that would make sense. It would. Um, I think she, according to Annalise, she was going through a divorce. And I feel like sometimes oh. when you're already low and your energy's not, you're not all, your game's not on all there. I think um, she was an easy target for something to cling on to her at that moment of her life because right. she, her energy was not being in the right space, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um yeah, and so she said that even when she got rid of her, um, she kind of still felt bad. She still, she liked having her, but she didn't like having her. It's like losing a part of you that had been with you for a while. She um, did miss her, but she goes, I don't want her back. There's been times where they see like a mist. Um, and she goes, I know it's not dust because there's no air movement back there or down there. And when you were to kick the ground, the dirt on the ground does rise, but it doesn't rise all the way up towards like your heads. And so a lot of times they would see a mist rise or appear. Mm -hmm. She said there was this one couple, a lot of times um, 
because the tour starts from a bar and then they go around the corner and they go down below. A lot of times people drink a lot ahead of time. Yeah. There was a couple and I guess they were just like making out and they weren't like following the rules. So she's like, I was going to um, kind of embarrass them or, you know, make them known that I need them to pay attention more. So she pushes the flashlight over to them, but above them, she's like, I could see like this mist of an outline of a person. And she goes, I feel like they were, that thing was sucking at their energy. Like Whoa. it was between the two of them. And um, somebody That's else that was on the tour, the other tour guide saw it. And she like, I see that. <laughs> like, and she goes, a lot of times, you know, there'll be days where nothing happens. And then there's a, a lot of activity. And I, what she did mention is after they did a lot of filming down there is when um, she feels like the spirits weren't happy with that. And there was a lot more activity and not necessarily good stuff that was happening after everybody was down there, hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Are they still um, open? I open. thought the Shanghai tunnels were closed now. Well, they're currently closed because of COVID, I they were closed um, before but that. they, um, no, it just says if I I went to their website and it says they're currently closed because of the COVID. Um, most of the restaurants and stuff. They said July of two thousand of this year okay. it may reopen. Okay. But Michael also just died, so I don't know if they have an idea of what's what the future holds at this point. Right. Huh. I know yeah. if you have stories about the actual bar itself being haunted, but I heard there was a lot of activity in that bar as well. Well, I imagine because a lot of the activity came from that, from that place. Yeah. They probably got most of their victims. I just can't imagine um, being at a bar talking to some dude and then you turn for a second and then you turn back and he's gone. <laughs> yeah. Think how many guys really thought, you know, Oh, that girl's going to hate me and, and think that I just, you know, left without her, <laughs> that I didn't like her. It really yeah. Well, I'm, I'm imagining like down there, there's, you know, some shady people that go down there now. Imagine then where, you know, it's just a place where people would, you know, stop in on their travels or whatever. Right. And, and maybe they work together with a bunch of groups of people. So I, what I was told is like sometimes they would purposely get somebody really drunk and then move them to that area oh. of the Shanghai, you know, the floor that's just going to drop out. It's pretty fucked up. <laughs> And I'm like, is that real? Does that happen? I mean, I know that they, I've heard of sex trafficking and yeah, all of that. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that it actually happens to this day. But I mean, if you can believe it to this day, then you have to be able to believe that it happened back then. I believe it just happened to adults then. Yeah, I believe that also sex, sex trafficking happened through the tunnels as well. I think that they were able to get women down there too, right? Well, and maybe that's why Nina was down there. I don't know the whole story about that. I'd have to look into that yeah. a little bit more. But um yeah. Well, I haven't done it with Melissa. There were, we had a big group of friends that we all loved that kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, one, me and one of the other moms, we sat down on the computer. We're like Googling like haunted places. Yeah. And, um, we found a, a review that somebody had left from like Motel 6. And um, let me think, uh, it was in uh, maybe Lincoln City. I think that's where it was. And it was a specific room number. So mm. Um, we go and you know you reserve this room you're like um and by the way I want room number you know 116 or whatever it was yeah. you know and <laughs> that just that room means a lot to me like they're probably thinking whatever weirdo and um so we go in and it's a like a one bed one bed it's like teeny tiny room and we go in there with like nine people <laughs> and like <laughs> we have and we're like oh we're pre they have all their sleeping bags in their arms and like oh they're gonna go home later you know just like they're probably looking at us like what is happening we didn't sleep all night basically and I was in there with another mom and like eight other kids like kids oh, like teenagers right, right. and below sure and every little noise somebody would scream and um do you ever play with a pendulum yeah Okay, so I brought that out, and then of course they're like going crazy, and every little noise they're screaming, and I'm like, "Shh, we're gonna get kicked out of here." And there were some um, things that had happened, but I can't say that it was a ghost. You know, sure, like there yeah. was um, weird noises within the room. We had this really weird reflection in a window and mirror, but I'm like, it's such a play on window mirror, window mirror that you're not really sure what you're actually looking at. Right. And so people are like, it looks like a towel and people are like, it's a face. And, but I can't say that's what it was. A again, it's like the, the person in me that needs to figure it out. Not the person who can just see it and relax. But Why did you pick that um, specific room? 
So we Googled um, like haunted things in Oregon and um, somebody had left a review on one of the sites. Like, um, I don't know if it was like a travel site, um, but it was a room um, at <laughs> it's a Motel 6. I was hoping it would be like <laughs> something you would see from, um, oh my gosh, the series with uh, the Psycho. Oh, like they, do you know no. what I'm talking about? The Bates Motel. Yeah. I was hoping it would look like that, like some creepy <laughs> course, place. Yeah. Not like this really, I mean, it was a really nice for a Motel 6. Sure. And, you know, we go in there and, of course, my husband's like, the only weird thing that happened this night is that we rented two rooms and you weren't in the one with me. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, that's the only thing strange that happened that night. And um, But we've gone, there's an old train trestle out in, um, like, Tannisborn area that's supposedly haunted. And we kind of went over there and we're like, you know, because I think we're already kind of freaking out because we went to this crazy place and we're the, seriously, we're all in our, at that time, like forties, early forties mm -hmm. and everybody else is like teenagers. Sure. So we're like the old people there. And from this train trestle, there is a rope hanging down in the middle. It looks like somebody is like, was hanging there or something. And of course we're like, Oh, what is that? We're all screaming. And, <laughs> um, so we have gone to these places. I've never experienced anything yeah. personally. I do get like, um, sometimes where I work, there'll be like, I'll get the chills in my neck and you'll hear weird things. But then the part of me that's like, Oh, that's probably just the heater or, you know, I don't take it as paranormal. I, I would probably be a good investigator because I would be like, well, that's probably this, right? It's you know, versus good. trying to, sure. Trying to figure it out. Yeah. But um, if you guys ever want to, I'd totally go explore something. Yeah, that would wanted. be fun. Wow. Yeah. be really fun. We, should, we could get our own little ghost that. kits. Yeah, get our little EVP recorders and we go out and yeah. ghost hunt together. That'd be a lot of fun. I mean, I'm totally, yeah. That would be fun. It wouldn't, I mean, it's so crazy how things are right now. I know, yeah. I would totally Maybe go. Maybe after the COVID yeah. passes would be a good time. Well, I think what would be fun is we go out and then we record our, like, talk about our experience. Yeah. And because all of us are going to have different perspectives of what had actually happened. Yeah. You know, and I think it would be really fun, especially if we did experience something would be even yeah. ex more exciting. That would be really cool. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Here are a few clips from my interview with Annalise and Sharon. They were tour guides for the Shanghai Tunnels. Now, you mentioned uh, Michael before. I don't know who he is. Can you explain to me? He oh, must be somebody yes. significant, so I don't know who he is. Can you do that? Okay. Yeah, so um, so have you ever been to the Shanghai Tunnels or taken any tours? Yeah, I've gone through um, twice. I didn't experience anything creepy. That's why I was really hoping that you could share some stories. Um, and I don't think a lot of people even know about the Shanghai Tunnels. I only found out like a few years ago, and I was born here. And so I don't, people really don't realize that. So I just wanted to share that with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Michael P. Jones um, was, he was the founder of the tunnels, basically. He, um, the tunnels were built in, um, well, as you, as you take in the tour, uh, 1850s. Um, and he, when he passed away, he was in his 70s. But he stumbled onto the tunnels when he was only seven. And he just, I mean, it's a long story on that, but he just spent his whole life researching the tunnels, um, helping preserve history there. Um, also, we would do work parties, meaning we would restore things that were falling apart um, and trying to um, tell the stories of the people that you know, struggled down there, um, and also just, you know, the history. He he really was into preserving history, because uh, Shanghai Tunnels is a lot of Portland history that a lot of people don't know about, because it's not pretty. A lot of it's not pretty. So anything, any city that has anything that's, you know, not, not, you know, good about them, they try to, like, sweep under the rug a little bit. So, he um, became a professor at uh, PSU, and he, you know, um, took his students down there. Um, this was in the, what, 70s, maybe 60s, 70s. And, um, you know, and that's where he met his wife, and his wife was also uh, very active down there. And um, their thing was to preserve history, but they never did tours. They never, I mean, that was never anything that they were intending to do. Um, but, you know, people started hearing about it and they wanted to go down there and explore. And so 
you know, Michael was kind of tired of hearing it all the time. He's like, okay, well, maybe I'll start a nonprofit and it, which uh, became Cascade Geographic Society. And um, all the profits that I make for, from the tours, we're going to put back in there and put it back in basically uh, restoring and um, cause you know, it costs insurance and all that other stuff. It's very costly to have tours. You have to have safety things, you know, it's, it's a lot, lot to it. Um, and so um, he had many other projects, but just the tunnels, but as far since we're just talking about the tunnels, um, that's kind of how it got started. He started doing tours. Um, I'm not sure when he started that in the nineties, maybe. Uh, I think 90s, it was like 24 years ago, maybe. I think it was like 24. It was either late 80s or early 90s. Yeah. So he'd been doing it for that long. And then, like I said, I joined about 10 years ago, Sharon, a little bit more than that. I had a thought, and it was something you had said, and this is a common thing. Um, and I'm maybe you are an investigator, maybe you're not, but the common thing that people say sometimes when they go to the tunnels is, well, nothing happened. You know, I didn't see anything. And I'm like, you cannot make things happen on command. It happens, you know. I have so many friends that have, they're like psychic or they're mediums and all of this stuff. And I'm like, and they're like, I don't know why I have this. And I'm like, I want it. I have nothing. I And I, I go to, and I had, I mean, I don't know. I just go to try to experience something and then nothing ever yeah. happens. And that's why I'm yeah. like, I saw that you're a paranormal, you know, investigator. I'm like, take me with you because... Well, chances are I'm like the cooler and nothing's going to happen when I'm there, but I wouldn't mind experiencing first off on my, myself. So, you know, but I, we always say when we, Sharon and I would give tours or, or whatever tour guides is there, we always say, this is not Disneyland. Like right. we would say that in our tour. This is not a prop show. This is not what you see on TV. Like if you go to, if you are watching those adventures, all those shows, you got to remember it's a show. I'm not. I'm not dogging those shows. I'm just saying, people think that everything happens every time, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Whatever. And Michael, his big thing was he wanted people to know that if something's going to happen, it is. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You can't make those things happen because we are there. We were there all the time, so we know when something's not right. We know when things are normal. But there's times when one day I'll go down there, get ready for my tour. Remember, it's pitch black down there. It's Sometimes all of a sudden my heart flutters and I get scared. Other times I get down there, I'm fine. That's when I know something's off. Like I know something's going to happen. You start to get down there all the time. You start to develop these feelings. Mm -hmm. But if you're going there one or two times, like once a year, whatever, that's just going to happen when it happens but you Sharon a, you get a feel for the energy yeah you can yeah. tell when you walk when you walk in um it just the energy would be different you're like oh shit we're gonna tonight. happen tonight <laughs> we always knew that oh here it goes you know yeah. and you know that energy I mean times there were times where I'm like I don't even want to go in there to set up yeah you know when I was by myself I'll be honest my biggest one was the rubber band thing on my hair. You know, I, I don't know if you've seen pictures of me, but I always wear ponytail holders. And you know those things don't break. And if they do break, it was because maybe it was weak or maybe used it a long time. But they're the ones that don't really break. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so I was down there, and there was another tour guide. His name's Dennis. And that's who my favorite tour guide is, actually, besides Michael. But, you know, of, of course, he's not going to be doing that anymore. But um, Dennis was a, and I hope he listens to this too, but he's a, he's a retired NASA scientist is what he is. Mm. And he, um, you know, he's he was doing tours, you know, he's retired. And it just seemed like every time I was with him, something or any of us were with him, it was always something that happened. And, of course, I was with Dennis. And my yeah, <laughs> and I'm like walking there, and my my you know I always wear my hair in ponytails, two ponytails, and one of my I felt my hair being pulled, which is a lot of the claims down there, and usually that doesn't really happen to me. This was like the first time, and this was I would say maybe seven years ago. I think it was about seven years ago, but um no maybe five maybe five years ago. So anyway my rubber band thing broke and I'm like, okay, you know, didn't really think anything of it. I thought, okay, it's faulty. Right. 
So I saw Cindy, she's another tour guide there to this very day, by the way. And I said, hey, you know, I need a, you know, little tie, whatever. She goes, oh, I have an extra one. She gave me one, put it in. So I'm helping, you know, I'm not actually giving the tour. I'm actually helping Dennis, okay? So I feel my hair being pulled on the other side, and that one breaks. <laughs> Remember, these things don't really break. I mean, yeah. it's rare, right? Right. And I'm like, okay, maybe I had a faulty pack or, you know, something. So I I find another one in my, you know, I happen to find another one, put it in. And, you know, we're doing the tours. And when we're done, we usually go upstairs where Hobo's is. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. That's how you take the tour. You meet at Hobo's in the, you know, the back in the alley. And then you go down. And so we always usually eat after a party after, you know, when we kind of talk about what happened in the tours or whatever. And Cindy and Dennis are sitting there watching me and they see my hair getting cold and then the rubber band breaks. Mm. <laughs> and for the so third time. they were like, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Andy, he's the owner of Hobos. He had a rubber band, like a, you know, like a rubber, rubber band. Yeah. So I put it in and I, we're talking, whatever. So I, you, I was living at Waterfront at the time, and so I'd always ride my bike when I'd go help out at the tours, and I was riding my bike home, and I felt my hair being pulled, and then the rubber band broke again, the other side, the one that I had, mm. and so I was like, okay, if you're with me, you cannot follow me home, because I was heading home on yeah. my bike, Yeah. so I'm thinking, I'm saying it out loud, and I'm like, oh, here it goes, you know. So I go into my apartment. Granted, my apartment is new. It's, it's, it's modern. You know, it's very new. I walk in my apartment, turn on the light, and the light bulb explodes, like physically explodes, and my other hair rubber band breaks. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and so anyway, I was like, um, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, this is it. And so it was funny at work. When I did a work order, the mechanic or the, the maintenance guy that fixed my light, he was like, what did you do? He goes, I've never seen a light break like this. He goes, not only did the light bulb break, but part of the, the bulb on the light fixture broke. And he goes, I've never, he goes, what happened? And I said, I turned on the light. That was it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it wasn't like an old place, an old apartment or anything. So, you know, things do happen. I, I don't ever feel like anything is being mean down there. Except it, it did kind of, there was a little meanness after Ghost Adventures was filming. I think that, you know, that's a long story too. But it's like, it's like a lot of times it feels like something's playing with you down there. Okay. You know, like, yeah. you know, whispering. I've been called a dirty woman down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been called, you know. It's, I could just, there's just thousands of stories, but that's like one of them. That's interesting. You know, I grew up, um, my I was the youngest, my, my sister's seven years older than me. And then my mom and my mom and dad were like hippies and my mom like played with Ouija <laughs> boards and all of this stuff. And so I think it was ingrained in me that I had this fascination from a very young age, but there was a time when my parents had gotten divorced and weird things started happening in our house. And so my mom is like, this yeah. place is haunted. And, um, the only other time I've ever heard this is you just said that is, um, only on my side of the bedrooms, the light bulbs would, um, they wouldn't unscrew, but they would just fall from the sockets and just bounce on the ground. And so my mom would have to turn off all the power to the house to get the metal part back out. But like, that's the only other time I've ever heard of like, you know, light bulb, like, you know, lights will turn off yeah. and that kind of stuff, but not like yeah. explode and do yeah. things like that. So I was like, Ooh, that's kind of weird. Again, I never felt, or I just knew I was really scared of the bath, like the, the shower head in the bathtub. And I would make mm -hmm. her like cover it. But that was the only thing I remember in that house. But my mom and my sister have like terrible stories. My sister would, um, she yeah. hated the upstairs and she would sleepwalk up there and, and wake up up there. All these crazy, oh yeah, really fun stories, of course. But um, okay, that one's not cool. There was another group that did uh, tours. They had one room, it's, but it was right by our section. And a lot of times, you know, they would go down there and they do seances and uh, use the Ouija board. And we always had problems after that. Yep. It's because energy would turn bad. And that's when a lot of things would happen. I mm. mean, that's when that mist stuff, like, yeah. the, the worst thing that I experienced there was right after the other side had done a seance or whatever. I was standing near a door because I 
you know, was helping with the tour on this one. Cindy was getting it. And I just, for some reason, I turned around and I saw like this black smoke or, or mist, um, like it was heading towards me. And it just, it, it just came, it, it came into my body yeah. and I was standing there and I was just like, I, I wasn't feeling myself and I'm like, something's wrong. And I went to take a step, you know, to say, Hey, I need help. And when I took that step, it was like, I stepped out of it. And it, it that you know, I was like, okay, done. My daughter volunteered down there with me. Yeah. Um, and she was there that night. So I basically <laughs> left Cindy on her own for the tour to go get Shana <laughs> to come hang out by me because uh, 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 I, uh, that was, I never felt that before. I haven't since then, which is, you know. But you also to, to talk about what Sharon just talked about, like the smoky mist, whatever. Wait, people don't realize down there because everybody could say, oh, well, that's dust, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is dusty, but here's the thing. There is no airflow down there. So when you're walking down there, you've taken the tour. So when you're walking down there, kicking around, it does, it only rises so high up. It won't rise high because there's no airflow for it to go. So it stays low. Well, and I think that the other part is you've been down there. You've been down for many tours. You know the difference. And so I would take your you know, what you're telling me as truth, because you would know the difference yeah. between dust and what an actual mist. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we, people take pictures down there. It's so funny. People take pictures down there and they're like showing us, they're like, Oh my God, look at all these orbs. And I'm like, honey, I'm so sorry, but that's dust. Cause I want to be honest with that. I don't want him to, you know, that's my credibility too. And I'm like, see that that's all that is, is a bunch of dust. And it reflects that light when you take that picture like that. And so, you know what I mean? Because they would, that was the thing is, you know, remember dust. But when Sharon was talking about the, that, you know, dusty mist, that the smoke that she saw, I had the same experience down there with her daughter, matter of fact, which was nice because when you get somebody else that experiences with you, it's nice because then you, you know, yeah, validation yeah. That makes you're like, okay, I'm not making this up. But we were giving it to her. Actually, I was not giving it. I think I was helping with this one. And I think it was pretty much sure it was Michael giving it to her. And when we do that, I don't know if you remember when you first get down there, you go through the hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a door there and he's kind of talking about the den, you know, the, um, what is that called? The opium den. Yeah. And so I usually, he always likes the tour guide to stand by each door so nobody will go past it until it's time. Yeah. Um, so everybody stays together and it's a safety issue because also if somebody does have a paranormal, you know, um, experience and they're on their own, you know, it's, it's a safety thing. So yeah. it's not only safety because we know the rocks, we know the dips, we know everything, but it's also, you know, things can happen, you know? So I was guarding one door, his, her daughter, Shana was guarding another one and there was a couple and usually people. Some people get drunk at hobos and they come take take the tour, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what my tour. Uh, yeah, so they, there's one couple was making out and they weren't even paying attention to the tour. They were kind of doing their own thing, kissing, whatever. And I look and I was gonna make fun of them by shining my flashlight on them just because I was irritated. Plus, I was just you know being a little prankster. And Shana had saw this and I put my flashlight kind of like shined it on him, and you can see this zombie-like mist hover, hovering over them. It's almost like it was trying to draw their energy. Ew. And it was just like, and it was like, you could see the silhouette of a man and it was hovering high above them. And remember that dust does not go that high. It goes only to your feet. It won't kick up, but it won't kick up high like that. Yeah. And so I turned to Shana, flashed my light at Shana, and she mouthed, I'm seeing the same thing. Yeah. And we both saw that. And then all of a sudden it just started disappearing, but gradually disappearing. And I was, I'm still in shock with that thing. I mean, I'm still like, what the hell? It was just feeding off their energy. And that was at the beginning of the tour. So it's like, you never know. You never know when things are going to happen. It can, you know, there's times when it can go weeks without anything happening. And then all of a sudden something will happen. 
Mm. It's just, that's just how it is down there. Now you said that people take pictures. Have any of the pictures ever shown anything or is it all just kind of like, you know, you can. No, there's, yeah, there's times and we always tell, and just being a paranormal investigator that we are, and just, you know, the training over the years, you always, you know, I usually in the beginning of my tours, at least I would always tell them pictures are allowed, not recordings, but pictures. And if you take a picture, you want to take three in a row. Don't just take one picture and say, oh, hey, look at this. You have nothing to compare it to if you take one little picture, right? Yeah. But if you take three, boom, 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 and you see the same thing in each picture, eh, maybe it's nothing. But if you see it in one frame and then kind of going away or just not there at the other pictures, then, you you know, that's a little more credible. You might have caught something there. Yeah. But, yeah, there's. I mean, have you seen like a really good one from somebody who stepped in? I submitted I in. had some really good ones. I mean, we I, ourselves did, but that I was talking to were going. Computer crash. Yeah. But now, I mean, I've gotten uh, class A EVPs. But mm. <clears throat> a lot of this stuff is, it just, it happens normally. Um, She's talking about pictures, though. So. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying, though, it's, it's sometimes it's harder to get the pictures when, you know, you're, you're down there all the time and this stuff is happening, you know, you see a head pop out and then <laughs> pop back in and you stand there and you're kind of stupefied. And you're, like, <laughs> you're in shock, right? Oh, it's like, oh, Michael. Yeah. it's yeah. like Michael would say, he goes, it's not, people have asked him and asked us all the time, like, were you scared? It wasn't that we were scared. We we're shocked. And before you had time to react, make a picture or do whatever, it's gone. Yeah. There were a couple you know, it's there. gone, yeah. you know, so my stepdad did, and this should be on on shop, not I can send it to you. This would be fun for you. It is a picture that my stepdad had never taken a tour. And uh, this is also another story that we both know, but it's, it's a famous picture at Shanghai Tunnels and it was what my dad took and he was visiting from Idaho and he's a photographer, my stepdad. And um, he was really excited to see the tunnels. Michael was given a tour and all of a sudden, Michael started stuttering. He started stuttering, choking, hacking. And I'm about to ask, like, what the hell's going on? And then I thought, something's going on, you know? And my, I call him dad, but he's my stepdad. He um, told me at the time he felt the urge to take pictures of him. And so he did. He was taking pictures of him. And I'm thinking, okay, dad, this guy's having a problem taking pictures, you know. I'm like, really, dad? Uh, so anyway, Michael's fine. You know, he completes the tour. Well, my dad, and this is a time where you didn't really use your phone. You used the actual, you know, camera. Yeah. This was, that's how long ago this was. It was, I think, when I first started giving tours, which was 10 years ago, whatever. Um, and so my dad went to Idaho and they were really excited about the Portland trip and they were downloading all the pictures on the computer. Like, you know, you used to do. And my mom was all excited. They were sitting at the chair on the computer, looking at all the pictures. And my mom leaves for a minute and my dad is freaking out. He's like, Oh my God, Erica, come here. And he's like freaking out. And they look and you see Michael, you know, giving the tour and you see this big arm around his neck and hand around his neck, like trying to choke him. Whoa, Remember I, I told you Michael was choking? Yeah. yeah. And you see this black arm and then you could see the ears in the background. And it's kind of a famous picture we have at Shanghai Tunnels and we have it in our museum, but I have a print, a little picture. I can always send it to you, but and when I showed Michael that picture, his wife was not very happy. <laughs> Did Michael but, feel you know, like he was like, being choked or that he was choked? Yeah, he okay. goes, it was, yeah, he goes, it was so weird because I felt like something was, you know, choking me and I, I felt like I was going to pass out. But then he said he, re he regained, you know, Yeah. but usually Michael would tell us like if he was quiet or, you know, if he if he felt if we felt like he was a little off then something's going on and to take pictures but my stepdad didn't know that yeah so didn't he always tell us that if he was quiet for a while like you once you always tell you can always can. tell yeah because he was very open and was very sensitive to things and I mean there was a one time he said he told us that um and this was before Sharon and I or maybe it was with Sharon but he had said he was around the boots. You remember the Shanghai, you yeah. know, the boots yeah. that were left. And he said he was given a tour and he said that, you know, this this kid and guy were fighting about money. 
And he said he was pissed because he's sitting there trying to give a tour, right? And he was wondering why we were not intervening, uh, intervening, or what's that word, my English? Intervening. Yeah, that um, we were not trying to stop these people from talking so loud so we can give the tour, right? It was like disrupting. And, you know, he said, yeah, they're like fighting about money. And he was like all freaked out, you know, it's just like, and he was really upset. So when the tour was over, he had a talk with you know and he said well why didn't you guys go over there and stop them they were very disruptive and they're like what are you talking about there was no guy and kid talking about money so what he said that it probably was was you know they did hire homeless kids to do some of their errands down there like clean out the you know buckets and things like that and maybe they didn't get paid or you know that they scammed him out of their money or whatever but you know, there was always stories like that, you know, or there was Victorian, you know, there was women dressed in Victorian clothes that Michael would see and, and they'd be standing there and he was like, oh, did somebody come from a costume party? And we wouldn't say anything. And then that's when he'd know not to tell the audience that because they would think he's crazy. So he said he would just be quiet, not say anything and then tell us at the end. And so to him, they looked know, real, he, like real people. Yeah, yeah. He said they were just like you and me. And, but, you know, that was some of, but some of you guys would be down there, talking. like you guys would be down there with him and wouldn't see it. Is that correct? No, and yeah. he would. Yep, yep. And there's times when I've talked. I have that same experience. I was talking to somebody, and he had a sailor hat thing on, and I was like talking to him, and then found out I wasn't really talking to anybody at all. <laughs> And, like, you know, like, I had also a ghost attachment there. Like, other people and, saw and you enough. talking to this person, and then, yeah. but, it, but it looked like you were talking about to yourself? Yeah, and then, you know, I was waiting for this guy to come out to, to talk to him more, and he never came out, so I'm, like, worried he's, like, you know, got lost with the tour, because that's what would happen. That's why we always had a tour guide in the back and the front, because we didn't want to lock him down there, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, I'm thinking, where is this guy? <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, we got to go get him, you know? And we could never find him. We never saw him again. It's like, really? You know? <laughs> wow. So, you know, happen. What's even and more like interesting said, is if they would talk back to you, like you were having a conversation exactly. with them. Yep. Wow. Yep. That's impressive. Yeah. That is the conclusion of our show. I hope you learned a lot about the Piddock Mansion and the Shanghai Tunnels. And a big thank you to the Fireside Phantoms for joining us today. And if you'd like to get a full copy of the interview with the Shanghai Girls, you can find that on our Patreon page. Don't forget, on August 3rd, Suzanne Jockis will be back on our show. She is a local psychic here in Portland. She takes up to seven of our callers, but you do have to sign up on our website and we have a link to our sign-up genius. So please go and find that. You can also find it on our Facebook page and our Instagram. Thank you again. Have a good day. Hey, Melissa, what kind of bras do you wear? Oh, my gosh. I wear handful bras. Tell me why you love them so much. You talk about them all the time. And I just want to understand what is so great about them. Well, I love them because they're comfortable. They are not constricting, so I can still like breathe and move around. And I like to do yoga too, and I like to stretch. And I do not like a bra that is just like sucking me in so that I'm so flat and can't breathe. I love the patterns. I love the different styles. Right now, they have this really cute like teal color, and they've done a couple patterns in it too. And they have this wavy one, which I can't even remember the name because they have absolutely adorable names for these things, but they have the adjustable bra, which is their classic. They have the closer bra, which is great for people like you that have a little more than a handful. It's got the two little hooks and then it zips up. And my favorite um, pattern right now is the ripple effect is what it's called. And then I love the double down, which is a really cute new style that they have. And I love their leggings because I think they made them for me because they're so long and they have a cute camo legging that I wear all the time.
I have those too. Brandy gave me a pair. Oh my gosh. I, I love do have to say, I have a, like a bunch of handful of bras. I could not find them. And I found them in my daughter's room. She wears them all the time and they are so cute. She almost could wear them as swimming suit. In fact, I think she does. Like she'll sunbathe yep. in them because they are so cute. And I love when she wears like her tank tops, but you can see the bra strap kind of through it because they have their really cool crisscross and different designs. You can adjust them however you want. And uh, I just think they're very flattering. Yeah. And you got your first one. How, how's your first one? I love it. No, I, I had them in the past. And then, you know, for me, I needed a little bit more. And then they came out with this new one with the extra zip in it. And it really makes a big difference. And I love that it, it actually gives you two, not just one. And that's always been a problem in the past. You just get this like one mono boob. I actually still have two when I wear this new design that you had given me. So thank you, Melissa. You're so welcome. Well, we do still have a handful code as I recall. We still do? I think so. If not, we'll get That's it up. That's like updated. 20% off. Why aren't people buying these off the shelf? I don't know. I don't know. They should be. What is that code? Melissa, that, tell me. That code is Salon Sleuths. Gosh, you're putting me on the spot now, Leslie. I think it's just Salon Sleuths. If you yeah. go to the coupon code, it's just Salon Sleuths. Like, yeah. yeah. But, but you have to spell Sleuths right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm part of this podcast and I spelled it wrong when I made your first tank top. It did not. I was thought that was so stupid of me, but how do you spell it, Melissa? You spell it S-A-L-O-N-S-L-E-U-T-H-S. Go to handful.com. Check them out. You'll be a fan for life. 